Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I am your host, Rex Baer, and we have a special guest with us tonight that is very knowledgeable with biblical prophecies, Peter Klink. Peter began his Bible education at the age of five and never really stopped. As he trained to become a scientist, he began to discover amazing answers to many of the biblical questions. He is working on a follow-up book right now that will explore humanity's connection with the higher power and the spiritual world. Currently, Peter lives in Milford, Pennsylvania, and has been in several different editions of Who's Who throughout his educated and professional life. Now this is a quote from Peter. My research started almost 30 years ago. A thought came to me one day, if the Bible was really written for the generation who were living in the last days, then there should be plenty of evidence that could be proven either scientifically or historically and free from religious dogma. I was right. I found what I was looking for, end quote. Peter, it's a pleasure to have you on the show here with us tonight here at The Leak Project. How's it going? Very good, Rex. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you've just done so much research and your website, peterkling.com, has several videos, uh, current events, topics, and a lot of knowledge uh, with biblical prophecy and what we were talking about a moment ago before the show started, the ET phenomenon. Uh, I asked you before the show if you thought some of these pictures taken from the Soho telescopes that you can see what looks like these giant spaceships, kind of Star Trek style, if, if those were the ETs you were referring to that we had to worry about. And you said, no, they don't use spaceships. I was wondering if you could touch on that. Yeah, sure. You know, it, it all has to do with really who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and what our future is. And the one thing, that the biggest thing that we face is that we only live at the most, maybe 100 years. Most of us don't make it to that. Most of us don't see 70, 75. However, a few do, but still only at 100 years, we are, not, we are cosmic infants, cosmic newborns. So we virtually know nothing about the cosmos. Our scientists have based everything on a static Earth. In other words, the Earth has always been like this. Well, it hasn't always been like this, and we haven't always been here. Uh, we have so much battling back and forth between science and religion, and it goes actually beyond that because science doesn't have it completely right, and religion, forget religion, has it, doesn't have it right at all. Uh, but when you combine the two, you start to get some real answers. And it's, it was after a couple of things led to this. I actually was in a debate. I was uh, about 26 at the time. I was in a debate. I took the biblical end of creation, uh, and I went up against somebody who took evolution. And the best I could do is stalemate them. And I felt that as a, I took that as a loss. And I felt badly afterwards. It's like I came away and I, I didn't win. And if you don't win, you lose, right? right. So there was no, there were no clear winners. There were no clear losers. It was, it was a stalemate. It was, it, we got to the point where we, you had to agree to disagree. However, it wasn't too long after that that I realized something in reading a passage out of Job. It's Job the, in Job the uh, 38th chapter, I believe it's the, 20, around the 20th verse, 21st verse. Okay. God is, at, God is asking Job, have you seen my storehouses of snow and ice, which I have saved for the day of distress and war? And I'm thinking, what did Job know about snow and ice, especially warehouses of it? Where would these warehouses be? And I learned to meditate, active meditation in the style of Edgar Casey. And I looked through the eyes of Job, and I saw mountaintops covered with snow. And I said, no, nah, that can't be storehouses. And then I moved myself away from Earth as if I was traveling away from Earth. And I'd see more mountaintops with more snow. And then all of a sudden, I realized <gasps> the warehouses are at the poles. Well, how do you use ice as a weapon? Either you create more of it, or you shrink it, melt it. And if you melt it, what happens is that that weight redistributes around the world and we wind up having earthquakes in one place after another, just as Jesus said in the prophecy of Matthew 24. So I'm thinking, hmm, that was the key. It was if we live in the last days, then there has to be scientific proof. And so that's what I did. I started looking for the scientific support. Now, I found it right away. Genesis 2, 21 through 23. God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to create a helper for him. Now, pay attention to this. 
He causes a sleep to come over the man. He opens up the flesh. He removes a rib tissue sample. He closes the flesh and he proceeds to make a, a woman out of the rib that he took from the man. And he brings the woman to the man and the man says, at last, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. This one was taken from man. I shall call her woman. Adam knew that he was speaking to his cloned twin sister. So who were the genetic engineers? You see, his tissue sample was taken. It was sent down to genetic engineering. Simple operation was performed. Flesh was opened. A tissue sample was removed. The flesh was closed. It even says the sleep came over the man. He was anesthetized. So who were the genetic engineers? You see, once we ask who are the genetic engineers, then you got to ask, well, why did they put us here? What's the whole purpose? Why are we here? And if the gods put us here, then why are things so screwed up? We've got to take a step back to Genesis, the first chapter. It says, let us make man in our image. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I have referred to that reference before with, um, you know, trying to have a, a decent debate in this subject because of person's beliefs and my beliefs, obviously. And um, they always say, oh, well, that's the Trinity. That's the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, am I wrong? No, that's religious dogma that you just mentioned. It, it, it's, it, and, and we'll get into a little bit of that. Let us create man in our image. Okay. When we look at the fossil record, we have a record that goes back all the way to cyanobacteria, extremophile bacteria, bacteria that can live in an extreme environment. And they find these bacteria on the planet today. Like they go to places like Yellowstone and you got bubbling cauldrons of 212 degree water and this stuff that lives inside of that water. You have water that's extremely acidic or extremely caustic and stuff lives inside that water. It's their home. So what's the connection between us and them? Well, scientists now have figured out, your genetic engineers have now figured out by unraveling the human genome, our DNA contains all the information to recreate all life on this planet, right down to the cyanobacteria. Think about that. Hence, humans are the pinnacle of creation or the pinnacle of genetic engineering. You see, because scientists go, who go by this theory, and it's still a theory of evolution, have no explanation for how the Cambrian period started. Let me, let, let's talk about the Cambrian period for a second. Prior to the Cambrian period, which is about 500, 500 million years ago, according to the fossil record, uh, prior to that, there were only simple life forms, bacteria. The most complicated life on the planet was a jellyfish. That was it. And then we get to uh, the Cambrian period and life explodes on this planet. There's so much life on this planet, such a variety of life, not just the amount, but the variety. This, there has never been that variety on this planet ever since. We have only gone through extinction level events, approximately five major ones. We are now facing extinction event number six. You know, with that said, there's a lot of speculation that there's this binary star system that is taking its orbit, getting very close to Earth right now. And I've interviewed some people that are very well versed in the subject. I know we've talked to Steve Olson, Bob Evans, Bob Fletcher, and uh, Gil Broussard. They've all got a little bit different opinions on it. So what I like, though, is I have seen a few images that definitely make me question the possibility of there being these heavenly bodies that are getting close to Earth right now that we were taught in school should not be here. Most of the stuff I see, I can discredit pretty quick as being some type of lens flare, solar flare anomaly, or just something. But there's a few out there that I definitely say, wow. There's, yeah, there's research that's, and first of all, I'm, I'm not going to support any photographs of two suns in the sky, number one, because we're not going to see this thing, not yet anyway. And the, the photographs that we see of two suns or even three suns are usually caused by a, an optical illusion. There's always clouds in the pictures. You ever notice that? There's always clouds in the pictures with two suns. Most of them. But it's not yeah. just the rule. It's like it's reflect. the sun is reflecting off of another body almost. 
Yeah, kind of. And I understand. I, I've seen all of the pictures. I'm now, pretty neutral on the subject, but there are a couple that I'm like. <laughs> yeah, hmm. you, you look at them and you say, that just shouldn't be there. That's just not right. And, and we do that with a lot of stuff that we see. Now, a lot of the stuff that's on the Internet now is produced. It's well produced. Right. Using computer graphics or whatever. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, actually, when I really got into the meat of, of this research to, to, to bring it up to speed, uh most of what was on the internet was done by people like me or people like you who were researching su subjects and they were putting their hard research onto the internet. And so the internet probably had about 75% truth. Now we have to search for the truth on the internet because most of it's lies. <laughs> Thank you, NSA. They don't just listen, they write. So here's, here's the situation. We have to be very discerning in everything. Now, something is there. There's no doubt about it. But is it unnatural? Because if it's a binary star, it's been cycling for at least close to 5 billion years. It has had to because the Earth is at least 5 billion years old. So it's natural. It's been there before. Has it been the thing that has created extinction-level events? Probably not. Probably not. But it brings stuff with it. Uh, we have to look at supporting evidence because photographs can lie. Photographs can be, especially, especially digital photographs. You know, when the photograph used to be on film, you could go to the film and examine it under a microscope and you could see if it was manipulated or not. You can't do that with digital images, only with film. You can look at a negative and you can see right away if it's been retouched. You know what I have noticed? Airbrushed. Oh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, Peter. Yeah, I was just going to say. That's okay. Go ahead. You know what I have noticed is there's been people that have contacted me that I know um, that aren't even really conspiracy theorists that have called me in, from Branson, Missouri and said, hey, I saw this thing in the sky and it looked like a you know, second planet or second sun or something. Can you tell me anything about planet X? And then I just gave, well, this is what I've heard. I've had multiple emails from all over the world, people that I don't know, that have said, I can see something in the sky. I definitely see something there. So, you know, the people that I don't know that are sending me emails, I can't validate that, but I can certainly validate people that I know personally calling me up that have no desire to start a conspiracy theory or start some type of, you know, um, <laughs> spooks or goblins or anything like that. Yeah, so, well, is something there? Yes, something is there. Exactly what it is, we're not sure. But let's take a look at, at what our data indicates. Now, uh, was it University of California just released information a few months ago about uh, this planet? Caltech. Oh, Caltech. Yes, thank you. Uh, Caltech uh, released the information on this uh, body that they have found in space, and they've, they, they haven't found it with the Hubble telescope. They're getting radio uh, waves back from it that indicate it's a large body. Why can't they see it with the Hubble telescope? You see, they, they should be able to see, if not the Hubble, what's what's the other one that's up there? I forget the, the name of it. We well, have two you've got tele Lucifer telescope here. Oh, well, that, that, that's on Earth. I'm talking about in, in orbit. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but yeah, well, maybe they are seeing it. Yeah, and, and you see, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but they're not telling us. You see, the people that know aren't telling us. Now, you brought up a good point, Lucifer. Lucifer is the largest infrared telescope on the planet, and it's owned by the Catholic Church. Right. Why would they name their telescope Lucifer? Well, I, I have I just got this information two days ago, literally, and that is that Pope Paul said Jesus ain't coming. I'm sorry, not Pope Paul. Pope Francis has said Jesus ain't coming back. So we're going to start worshiping Lucifer because he's going to be our savior. Did you see that video footage from the Vatican? It's a couple years old. There's there's two videos that just blow my mind that I'm thinking about from the Vatican, but one in particular, um, the audience is singing, you know, everybody in the congregation is singing a song in Latin, and the translation of the words are on the bottom of the screen, and they're worshiping Lucifer. They're thanking Lucifer, essentially Absolutely. saying that he is the Savior. And it, it, I was like, wow, really? Yeah, really. Did Absolutely. you see that? Absolutely. You know, yes, I, I did see it. And it, it, it horrifies me. It really does. It horrifies me. Now, I, I've got a personal stake in this. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. We'll talk a little bit more about me. But, you know, you raised some interesting questions. First, we are here. And I, I want to just dive, uh, go back to Genesis a little bit first. Um, when it says that we are made in God's image, what's made in God's image? You see, biologically, we are vessels. Are you familiar with admiralty law? Vaguely. That okay. Has, uh, vaguely, yeah, like natural law? No, 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 no. Admiralty law is law that the United States and most of the world is under right now. Okay. In other words, we don't follow the law of the land. We follow the law of the sea. And that's why there's a gold fringe 
around all the flags in court. So when you go to court, you are viewed at as a or viewed as a vessel. The same as the ship on your birth certificate. Uh, it's all in capital letters. And then they give you an SS number. So technically, I am the SS Peter Kling. You see, I am a vessel as we all are. Now, what are we vessels for? The image of God. You see, the biological vessel is not who we are. It's the soul vessel, our consciousness and life force, which is in the biological vessel, which keeps it alive, which was made in the image of God. Now, how do, how do we support this? Science. See, one of the things, when, when, I, when I first started my research, this started around 1980, after, I started the research after, a biblical education that started prior to the age of five, which lasted 15 years. And it wasn't a biblical education given to me by the church. Some very interesting people showed up at, at the door when I was about four years old. And next thing I knew, I was studying the Bible. Studying the Bible with some kind of old folks were teaching me things that had nothing to do with religion. They were teaching me history and prophecy and the exopolitics of what is within the scriptures. Now, there's a little oddity, something that I could never quite figure out in my life. And I, I got a little piece of this a few years back. And that was, oh, well, my, my ancestors through my great grandmother were French Huguenots. They, they were involved against the Reformation. And I thought, well, maybe that's why, you know, my grandparents didn't like the, the church and so forth and so on. And I thought, well, that's an interesting connection here, doing what I do today. And my, you know, few people were part of the Reformation. Yeah, about a month and a half ago, I came across another piece of family history, very interesting piece of family history. It turns out 500 years ago, my grandfather, my great grandfather's side, see both sides were, and this is documented throughout, uh, throughout history too. Uh, it, it's almost funny. Uh, my great grandfather's side, and they were all Lutheran, which made, which, was what I totally grew up with as a very young child. Uh, that was the first church I was taken to. It was a Lutheran church. I was maybe about three or four. Uh, and, and then it was, but I wasn't taught in the Lutheran religion. My, my grandparents were Lutheran. Anyway, as it turns out, my family, which immigrated from Germany, uh, were part were uh, indigenous in the Saxony area of Germany, which is Berlin, Leipzig, down through that area. And we were bell makers, that I knew. We were also sword and armor makers. Uh, the, the correct name was Klingenschmidt. Not only did we make swords and bells and armors and things like that, we were strong supporters and personal friends of Martin Luther during the Reformation. As a matter of fact, my family helped hide Martin Luther during that time so he could write or translate the Bible from Latin into German, and it was printed on Gutenberg's press, the first movable type printing press. So we actually helped change history. Now, for that, the Catholic Church hunted down my family for 200 years and murdered us whenever they could find us. And so we scattered across Europe. Some of us came to England. As a matter of fact, a, a distant cousin uh, two of them came to England, two brothers came from Europe to the United uh, to America in the mid 1600s, and they started moving west. They formed uh, the, uh, they actually built Fort Klingon Smith in Pencil Western Pennsylvania, just at, which is now the city of the town of Jeanette, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia, uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, it was at this fort uh, that was raided by the Seneca Indians. And the Seneca Indians captured two, two uh, Kling and Smith boys, the children. The youngest, uh, the oldest escaped the same night. The youngest uh, was never seen from for quite some time. And we, we know later on, through, because of the record, that uh, this young Kling and Smith boy, who uh, went on to be, I guess, traded, but he came to live with the Oneida Indians in uh, uh, western New York. And not only did he live with them, but he became chief. He was actually the first white chief of an American Indian tribe. Chief Good Peter was his name, also known as White Peter. His name was John Peter Klingensmith. So it's interesting we, that the family uses the same names over and over. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have this long connection. Now, it was, the Napoleonic Wars stopped the church from attacking us. So here, I, here it is, uh, 500 years after, the, after this all started, and a Klingensmith, shortened name Kling, is doing the same thing? Hmm, how did this happen? Too many interesting synchronicities. Well, the people that taught me the scriptures were involved during that time, and they weren't actually people as we consider people people. 
they were part of a special group of people that go all the way back to the original 12 apostles. They were the part of the 120 at Pentecost. They were part of the seven congregations of Asia Minor that are talked about that uh, John writes letters to in the Revelation. And then they kind of vanish, only to reappear at the Reformation. Then they vanish after the Reformation, only to appear in my life 50 years ago, 55 years ago now. So there's an interesting cycle that repeats. So something started 50 years ago. What, what, 55 years ago? What was it that put me on this path? Now, an interesting thing happened. At the age of nine, I had a dream, and I actually saw the future. And then I lived through the future that I saw. When it happened, it terrified me. I went running home to my – I was walking the dog. It was my job to, to walk the dog at night. And uh, he, he was a trained German shepherd. He was a guard dog. My dad had a business. So I was, and this was 1965, so it's not like you're walking the streets of America today. Uh, so here's a little nine-year-old kid who could speak German and talks to a dog in German, and he could have the dog turn around and rip your lungs out. But <laughs> So I was, I, I was totally safe. But on the way home, uh, I saw these three men. It was the three men that I saw from my dream. Now, one was dressed like a, a normal hippie. And he had a poncho, blown out blue jeans, sandals, long hair, beard. The other guy was dressed kind of like he just came out of an Errol Flynn movie, in a Robin Hood movie. He had just looked look, look like Errol Flynn out of a Robin Hood movie, seriously. And the third one was dressed like Jack Frost, had a stovepipe hat, had a black cape, white shirt, uh, shiny black shoes, black pants. And these three men walked right past me at the, during, in the night as I was bringing my dog back home. And when I saw them, they terrified me. And I told the dog, watch out, these bad men. And the dog watched them too. This wasn't just happening in my mind. And after they w walked off into the night, I ran home as fast as I could, ran up the stairs. My mother was washing the dishes and said, Ma, Ma, I, I just had a dream that came true. She said, that's nice, honey. It's time for you to go to bed. I was devastated. I was like, whoa, 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 what? The most fantastic, incredible thing in my life had just happened. Now, what, helped, what made this fantastic and, and incredible is that I already knew about the prophets. I already knew about young Samuel, how he was given to the temple at five years old and how God started using him at, at the age of eight giving him messages to give to the high priest. I knew all these, uh, all these events. But now the spiritual door had just been slammed in my face, so to speak. So I had to know how that was possible. And so the nine-year-old turned to science. And so I grew up with a biblical education and a scientific education. I had my first chemistry set at the age of 10. I just kept on trading up chemistry sets until I started working in one of the best laboratories in the United States. Cool. Yeah, so... <laughs> I just kept on trading up, you know, I just went, went to a prep school, went to college, went and started working in, in the professional area, and, and then just wound up in one of the best laboratories in the United States, and still searching for questions. How did we get here? Who are we? You see, the problem is our science didn't advance far enough to understand the scriptures. I talked about genetic engineering. You know when we found out that we could genetic engineer stuff? After we fa figured out what DNA was. That happened in 1955. The scientists discovered DNA. A few years after that, in the early 60s, they, they realized that they could manipulate the DNA. And then by the late 60s, they realized they could genetically engineer DNA, and they had a convention. They brought all, the, all these scientists together that were working on, the, on the, the genome project, and they said, okay, where does science end and where does playing God begin? They wanted to set up rules, guidelines, to, so they don't start playing God with the human genome. None were ever set up. There are no laws in place to, to uh, humans have free will to do whatever they choose to do genetically to the human genome. And I'm, think, I was, I'm thinking of these bugs. They're called indestructible microanimals, a.k.a. water bears that can survive in space literally for years. And they're these little tiny microscopic bugs. And if you zoom in on them, they look like a almost like some type of grizzly bear with a weird face and a snout. Yeah. They look like they look like jelly bears. Yeah, jelly bears. <laughs> you know, you know the, the the little bears that you get, the the the, the little jelly bears or jelly worms, the things that you know the, the snack. <laughs> they, they look just like the jelly bears. <laughs> They're very interesting looking, and I I'm thinking of a conversation that I had with a futurist named Ivan Zoltan. This guy is actually running for president as the transhuman uh, candidate, and a real nice guy. He's super far out there with some of his ideas, and I mean, I can appreciate that. I certainly don't ever want to be hooked up to a bunch of nano chips and, and have a microchip in my hand like he does, um, but hey, that's his thing, and, and right on. But, you know, I'm bringing him up in that conversation we had up because you were talking about the, genetically modifi the genetic modification of humans and of beings and animals and all sorts of other stuff and how there's really no laws in place for that. Well, there's a lot of people right now that are doing stuff on themselves uh, to try and genetically enhance their abilities, like they're adding 
plant DNA and, and DNA from different species and stuff to their own. And it's, it's very interesting. So, I mean, I can certainly see the benefits of creating, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have an immune system that you could walk through ginormous amounts of radiation clouds and walk through the weaponized Ebola virus and anything else and just not have it affect you kind of like it, you know, it just doesn't work on your operating system. So it just automatically leaves and doesn't have any bothersome side effects on what you're doing. That'd be fantastic, especially with the world that we live in. But the problem is I think that they're going to be using this tech to create these, you know, just beast like just it's already been used. Yeah, they're already done. They, they've already done it. If you listen to the whistleblowers that are going on, there's a clone daily. And if you want to listen, if you want to really believe this, then we have to consider that there is a cloned alien army on Mars, there is a cloned alien army on the moon, and there is a cloned alien army on the Earth, and the ones on Earth are probably the worst because they have been genetically, en they genetically engineered bodies for the Nephilim. Now that takes us back. Yeah, there was a colonel that I, I caught, a, I don't recall his name, I caught an interview uh, that he had done about two years ago, three years ago. Remember when we had the earthquake in Virginia, he fractured the... the uh, uh, Washington Monument, oh, yeah. and this the same day we had an earthquake in right on the Colorado, what is it, Colorado, New Mexico border there, and, and people saying, oh, well, they're underground nukes that, are, that were being set off. They were, according to this colonel. They were underground nukes that were being set off to try to kill the Nephilim because they got out of control. And here's an interesting thing. He said that it didn't work. They're still there. And he said the only way that they can control them is by using the name Jesus Christ then they have to listen. Remember that. That's going to become important, especially if we wind up having an alien invasion, because it will not be an alien invasion as they want us to believe. Think of Project Bluebeam. Our military, the secret military, is so far advanced, and it's actually the church which has helped advance it. And we can talk more. There's not enough time in the show to get into all of this, but here's, here's the situation. Let's go back to who we are. You're right when you brought up the, the, the uh, water bear. NASA is already uh, working on genetically engineering humans for deep space travel because they know that our bodies are too fragile and that it would kill us. And so they are working on ways to re-engineer the human genome to be able for, to genetically engineer something that resembles human that will be able to endure space, deep, space, uh, deep space travel. Now, traveling space in the third dimension is insane. Can't do it. It would take us four years to get from here to Alpha Centauri, traveling at the speed of light, four years to get back. You will have aged eight, about eight years. Your, great, your children would be dead and your grandchildren here on Earth would be old, old people. Meanwhile, you will have only aged, traveling at the speed of light, you will have only aged eight years. Wow, how about that? Hmm. So, Traveling conventionally into space is absurd. Can't do it. You got to be able to bend space or warp it. Now, do we have that technology? Yeah, maybe. But let's like, we have to look deeper. You see, our science didn't develop enough to understand who we were and probably isn't still developed enough to understand the Bible fully. It wasn't until string theory came along that we could even start to understand the multiverse in which we live. You see, we used to think that Earth was, oh, dimensions one, two, and three. We knew that time, or we believed that time was the fourth dimension, and so we want to ascend to the fifth dimension because that's where paradise must be. That's the spatial plane. Uh, wrong. We are dimensions eight, nine, and ten. When we look at string theory, String theory states simply that there has to be 10 dimensions plus the dimension of time, 11 dimensions all, to, all together. Time is a variable across all dimensions. But there needs to be 10 dimensions for us to exist. Seven of those dimensions are what they call spatial planes. They are mathematically or physically smaller, metaphysically smaller, I guess, at this stage, than the three physical dimensions in which we reside that we believe are one, two, and three. No, eight, eight nine, and 10. So seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, are all fitting in 10, 9, and 8. Think of a Russian nesting doll. You know, you keep on taking the dolls apart and there's more dolls inside until you get to this little pea-sized doll. Right. Well, that's how, that's how our universe, or that's how our multiverse works. You see, we're the big nesting Russian doll on the outside. And what we call God is the little one on the inside. You see, it's actually God or Yahuwah, Yahweh, Jehovah is the singularity. It's not some alien being that's a God wannabe. It's the singularity. It's the pure 
dynamic energy. We go to Revelation. Revelation tells us the, in, in God's own words, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. Before me, nothing existed and after me, nothing will exist. Oh, wait a minute. We know by simple, simple physics that you cannot create nor destroy energy. You can only change its form. And so if nothing existed at one time, the only thing that could have possibly existed was pure dynamic energy, the God particle that CERN is so desperately looking for. Of course, now we, we find out that they're trying to open up portals to other dimensions. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. There's a bunch of nasties they're trying to bring here on Earth from Tartarus, a dimension outside of our 11-dimension our dimension multiverse. Uh, Tartarus is mentioned in the Book of Enoch. It's mentioned by Peter. It's also mentioned by Jesus' brother Jude as being a prison dimension, a place where the interdimensional nasties are kept. So here we are in this 10-dimensional multiverse, but we think it's 3D. Except at the soul level, when we meditate, our consciousness is not limited by the physical world. And the more we look at the physical world, the more we realize it doesn't really exist. At the atomic level, we go down to the atom. There is one part solid for four trillion parts of empty space. So everything that we look at is essentially hard light. Now, here's an interesting thing. You know, the electrons that spin around the atoms, right? Electrons are cool. Electrons can be in two places at the same time. So guess what happens when we think? The electrons in our brain are firing off, you know, in the thought process. And if we're thinking about somebody, you know, say a dear, sweet loved one. Well, the electrons are also with that dear, sweet loved one, letting them know that we're thinking about them. See, because electrons can be in two places at the same time. You ever have anybody call you and you say, I was just thinking about you. All the time. Yeah, it happens to me all the time. I do it on purpose. <laughs> I do. I do it on purpose. I'll think about some, somebody and then they'll call me within five minutes. Interesting thing. I thought about somebody I didn't want to hear about here from the other day. I, I erased their, their number out of my phone. The next day they called. I hadn't heard from them in three months. The next day they called. <laughs> <laughs> you get what you think for. Yeah, and so th that's exactly it. That's exactly it. That's the key. We think we get what we focus on. Now, is it our physical body that focuses? No. Through science, we know the brain is just a biological computer. It doesn't care what you put in. Bad information in, bad information out. You tell the brain, if you learn that the earth is flat when you're a kid, you're going to believe the earth is flat your whole life. As a matter of fact, there's a whole resurgence of people who believe the earth is flat. What's your Inter take on that? Do you think that that's like a big psyop? No. No, it's not at all. It's an alien psyop. It's an alien psyop. And it goes back to the Anunnaki. You see, the king of the Anunnaki god, Anu, is the god over a flat-domed earth. Anu is the flat-domed earth. So when people turn around and say, I believe in this flat earth, yeah, you dumb Anunnaki worshiper, you're being seduced into worshiping these alien life forms that are back. Where do they come from? Naburu. So the legend goes, now think about that. The dwarf star, it's been here before, connected with alien life forms, and they're back. At the same time, the church wants to worship Lucifer? Really? I wish we had enough time to get into the 10 days of, Mar uh, of uh, Mandela. But according to the information that I heard, you know, Nelson Mandela died twice. He died on June 26, 2013. And then all of a sudden, he miraculously got better again, and they sent him home from the hospital, only to die on December 5th. Interestingly enough, remember Comet Ison? The greatest comet a civilization oh, yeah. ever, ever saw? It was ended up turning good. a couple of times, didn't it? It was destroyed coming around the backside of the sun. Now, the interesting thing is, had Comet Ison survived, it would have aligned perfectly the day after Mandela was put into the ground. It would have aligned perfectly on December 16th with the, with the planet Venus. It would have looked like a giant exclamation point in the night, in the evening sky. You would have seen it beautifully just after the sun set because you could have, at that time, Venus was beautiful in the, in the evening sky. Beautiful, big and bright. And Ison, had it survived, would have made this long tail and the Mayans who worship Quetzalcoatl who uh, their uh, their snake god would have all been jumping up in the uh, up and down pointing to the sky at that time saying he's back he's back our snake god is back if anybody watched the live feed out of Soho when Comet Ison went around the back side of the of the sun they will tell you that they would realize that something was wrong the instant it came out the other side you know I knew something was wrong you know why the coma was blowing in the wrong direction. 
the coma always blows away from the sun. And when Comet Ison, you can still find this out on the internet. Go look up Comet Ison going around the sun. When Comet Ison comes out the backside of the sun, the, the, the coma is blowing perpendicular to the sun, not away from it. What caused the coma to, bur to, to, to blow perpendicular to the sun? I don't have an answer for that. But something destroyed Comet Ison. Something destroyed the sign of the Mayan's God. Think about that for a moment. Something destroyed the visible sign for the return of the Mayan's interdimensional alien gods. What was it? Who would have destroyed that sign? Could it have been another race? Let's go back to the, to, to the 10 days of Mandela. You see, it was during the 10 days of Mandela. Now, Nelson Mandela, who used to be public enemy number one in South Africa, became a Knight of Malta, a subject to the Pope, a citizen of the Vatican. And every major world leader was down celebrating the death of Nelson Mandela, eulogizing him. They were all standing next to a crazy man, signing in a language that nobody could understand, and no, no sign language interpreter could understand. And this man was involved in a murder years prior, a grisly murder, of which his two cohorts were put, given life sentences for. He was found unstable enough and put into, uh, too unstable to, and did, did, wouldn't understand what was going on. And so he was uh, sentenced to uh, spend time in an insane asylum. So how does this man who was involved in a very grisly murder, who was sent to an insane asylum, get to stand next to Obama? How did he get past security? And where did all these angels come from that he claimed were floating around, flying around in the arena? If you listen to the interview of him, he says he saw angels flying all over inside the stadium as he was translating. Well, out back behind the stadium was a black cubed tent in which all of these dignitaries were supposed to be signing a treaty with this off-planet entity known as Marduk. Now, Marduk in Babylonia was the chief god. In Samaria, he would have been called Anu. Think about that. Now, I can't prove it. I can't verify it. That's the problem. But even the Vatican signed off on the treaty. And now the Vatican says, we're going to follow Lucifer to get Christ. Interesting. There's only one country that didn't sign that treaty. Israel. Zionists are Molech worshippers. Molech is an Egyptian god, originated out of, an, out of Egypt. The god Set. When we look at the, ten day, uh, at the funeral of Mandela, what did we see on the podium? We saw a... Phoenix rising from a composite pyramid made of 13 smaller pyramids with a sunburst behind its head. A symbol of Isis. When Mel Nelson Mandela was put into the ground, we got a bloody revolution in Ukraine. We got an Ebola outbreak in uh, Africa. And two, three, less than three weeks after Mandela was put into the ground, we got the mercenary terrorist group Isis which has plagued this planet ever since. So why is this militant group given an Egyptian goddess's name? Hmm. Start to see these connections now? Off-planet entity, goddess Isis being given the name, being used as the name for terrorists, worldwide terrorists. We're making major impacts. There's this connection here. It's all part of a deceit plan. It's all part of a plan to change, to get us not to pay attention to what is really going on. You bring up comment. Uh, you brought up uh, Nabooru. I, we talked about it briefly, right? Acc according to now, now, first of all, let's let's digress. Most what science has found is that most stars are binary systems, and they believe yes, our sun is a binary system too, and that there is a brown dwarf star that is linked up with the sun. However, now enters the disinformation. Because is it this planet Nabu or is this Nabooru this sun, a brown dwarf star? Is it something else that's coming in? Uh, is, is it something that's already come and gone? My co-host on, on the show that I do uh, the, the final countdown, which uh, if you folks would like to follow is on Wednesdays, 5 o'clock Eastern time. You can go to my website, www.peterkling.com and uh, listen to it live there. Uh, also, uh, the, the other programs that are on the same station, are on the same networks, Late Night in the Midlands Radio Network. Uh, anyway, you can listen to us there, and we talk about this quite often. Now, according to my co-host who's written, written the book, Return of Planet X, Dr. Jason Rand, uh, he said that this magnetic force has already attached itself and is now in the process of leaving 
uh, we're dealing with a huge magnetic force that is influencing the sun. Now, something's influencing the sun, something's influencing the earth, we know that, based on what we're seeing. Just look at all the earthquakes all over the place. We've had, that this past weekend has been, since Friday, we've had several major earthquakes go off around the planet. Lots of 5.0s and above, a few 6s and even a 7.2, which wasn't reported. Oddly enough, the Chinese know about it. Uh, go to the USGS and start looking at the earthquakes for the last week. Actually, just the last four days. They just took off. Amazing. Anyway, it, it, they go on cycles. It's been recorded that, this, that the earth, which generally has the, the Schumann resonance, so the vibration of the planet itself, used to be uh, around 7. It's creeped up to 8.2. Well, they've been measuring it as high as 65 hertz. What is generating the earth to hit a vibration to, to go from 8 hertz per second up to 65 hertz? The thing that controls the vibration of the Schumann resonance of the earth is the lightning storms and the sun. Maybe CERN. There is some concern with CERN because they do generate enough electromagnetic energy to, to make this earth vibrate and to change the earth's very vibration. So there are things going on that we don't quite understand that are happening and they're happening in concert. And the one thing that's for sure, we see more and more UFO videos every day. We are not alone. I bet you the majority of people today believe, I know the majority of the people today, more people actually, according to the last statistics, which I read three years ago, 61% of the people believe in UFOs and alien species. 53% believe in God. Interesting. Or a God. But it still doesn't explain who we are. Just that we're not alone. See, when we go back and we go to Genesis, let us make man in our image. Well, the biological vessel is based on Earth. If Earth had more gravity, we'd be shorter. If it had less gravity, we'd be taller. If the Earth had a different environment, we wouldn't be breathing air. We'd be breathing some other gaseous mixture. Well, air is a gaseous mixture mostly of nitrogen with about 21% oxygen in it, or 20% oxygen, somewhere around there. Uh, and that's what keeps us alive. But if this was a water world... We wouldn't have feet, we'd have fins, because we couldn't survive in a water world with feet. Feet and hands would be useless. So our physical vessel, what they keep under admiralty law, is that, a vessel designed to be biologically compatible with the earth. So the vessel isn't made in God's image. It is the consciousness, which is our consciousness, our thought, you know, that thing that allows us to know that somebody's going to call before they call? It's just right. thinking about you. Yeah, why does that happen? Because it's our consciousness that can, communicates with other consciousness on the planet. As a matter of fact, science has found out that when our brain slows down to 7.5, 7.3 hertz, I think. No, 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 hold on. I believe it's 7 hertz even. 7 hertz. The hippocampus opens up or engages, the right hemisphere of the brain opens up, and now everyone who, whose brain is vibrating at 7 hertz per second or lower can mentally communicate with everybody else. And we can share each other's thoughts and knowledge. Yes, we do have a communal thought pattern among us. That's why you get to the 100th monkey and they all learn how to wash the rice. That's, that's uh, if, you, if, you, if you know the study... Um, they were feeding these monkeys on this one particular island. Uh, this was during after the nuclear testing. They were feeding these monkeys rice, and the, the monkeys would pick the rice up out of the sand, and instead of uh, just eating it with the sand on it, they would take it down to the shore, and they would wash the sand off of it, and then they would eat the rice without the sand. Well, after a while, more and more monkeys on the island learned to do this, and then all of a sudden, monkeys on other islands started doing it too. Now, That's a fascinating on, study. Yeah, how did the monkeys on the other islands start know to do what the monkeys on this island were doing? Just like a group consciousness, some type of quantum yes. entanglement. Yes, and so now, now we apply that to ourselves, and yes, there is a group consciousness. There is that consciousness where we can communicate with each other. Not only can we com communicate with each other, but we can, through meditation, we can see into the past or we can see into the future. Oh, you're crazy. Yeah, tell that to Edgar Casey because Edgar Casey said everybody can do it. Anybody who has done it will tell you, yeah, 
Casey was right. We all can do this, but we don't. You know why? It takes practice. How many concert pianists are out there? How many weightlifters are out there that can jerk 400 pounds off the ground? How many race car drivers are out there that get to the pinnacle of their sport? A lot of people play basketball. Very few make it to the final four. Very even fewer make it to the professional ranks. But how do you get to that point? You practice. You practice, you practice, you practice. Hey, I, I love my little next door neighbor kid. Great kid. I can pretty much guarantee you for about three hours in the afternoon, I'm going to be hearing a, ba a basketball bounce. I'm surprised he hasn't worn that thing out. Every day that kid practices and practices and practices and practices. I bet you he's pretty good. If he keeps on practicing and he gets better and better, he'll be part of a team. He'll go on to college and he'll become even a bigger star. And maybe, yes, one day he'll be the next uh, Larry Bird. He's a white kid. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> he can't really name him after a black star because he's going to, you know, unless we color him up or something. But anyway, he's going to be great <laughs> if he keeps practicing. And it's the same thing with using our mental abilities. You know, if you just pick up a guitar for the first time, you can strum the strings. And, and, and if it's in tune, you can play six notes without even knowing it. However, to be somebody like Jose Feliciano or an Eric Clapton, to pick up a guitar and make it sing, it takes practice. And it's the same thing with meditation. It's the same thing with using our consciousness. In order to be good at using our consciousness and to become consistent, we need to practice. We need to practice meditating. Now, there are four different stages in the human brain, four different levels, of, actually five. Eh, okay, technically, yeah, five. Uh, it starts off with gamma. We don't like to think in gamma. Gamma is an emergency type situation that allows us instant reaction time. Uh, have you ever been in an accident and everything goes in slow motion? I know what you're thinking? talking about, yeah. That's gamma. Your brain is thinking in gamma. Your brain is processing information. It's so fast that you can't even believe that it's happening. And usually you'll pass out because our brains will overload and they cannot take the heat that's generated in gamma. Both hemispheres have to be working at the same time. And the only animals on this planet that naturally think in gamma are dolphins. Think about that. Where we most think is in beta. Beta is, is our reactionary state. That's where we do most of our work. That's where we communicate mostly with other people. Uh, that's where we, can, where we hopefully we're driving to work in beta. Some of us will do it now, but hopefully it's in beta. Beta, is, our brain runs from uh, 12 to 35 hertz per second. Gamma is above 35 hertz per second. Beta is where we have the reactionary state of fight or flight. You put somebody in the ring, I guarantee you, they're in beta. Put somebody behind the wheel of a race car, they're in beta because they got to react quickly. Uh, beta is also where fear lives. If you're afraid, you're going to take flight. So the next level down is uh, out of beta is alpha. Alpha, interestingly enough, is where children spend most of their time. Children very rarely ever get to beta. As a matter of fact, they don't, children don't get the beta operating system until they go through puberty. That's why teenagers are so difficult to deal with. They're, they're going from that alpha into the beta and becoming, uh, they want to fight because that's where that response is. That's where I, kids are called hooligans, teenage boys, hooligans. Ain't nothing about a bunch of hooligans. All they want to do is fight. Yeah, well, that, they're getting that fight and flight response and they're taking advantage of the fight end. When we get out of that, we go into alpha. Alpha doesn't have any fight and flight response. Alpha is where we relax. Alpha is where we daydream. Alpha is where we pray. Alpha is where we meditate, where we start to meditate. If you're thinking about what you want to have for lunch, you're going to think about that in Alpha. Hmm, what do I want to have for lunch? Hmm, what do we have in the refrigerator? Hmm. What are you thinking about mentally of what you got in the refrigerator? You're now in Alpha. And then all of a sudden you picture a grilled cheese sandwich. Yeah, we got enough. We, I can make a grilled cheese sandwich for lunch. So you picture the grilled cheese sandwich. Now you get up, you go to the refrigerator, you take out the ingredients, you cook it up. You foresaw the future. You foresaw that your future had a grilled cheese sandwich in it. And so you went and you procured that grilled cheese sandwich. You see, you had faith in that. And the faith that it took to, have, to picture that grilled cheese sandwich, you put into action, you made yourself a grilled cheese sandwich. Oh, that's ridiculous. No, that's exactly how it works. It's the same process. You, you, lose a pet, you lose your car keys and you lose a dear loved one, a spouse. We go through the same process of denial, anger, grieving, and then getting over it. It's the same process. So it's the same process in seeing the future. So if you want to create your future, think about it. I want to go on vacation. Where do you want to go? Hmm. 
Bahamas sound nice. Really? You've been there before? Yeah, tell me about it. Oh, it's beautiful. Sandy shores, cool breeze, oh, the tropical drinks, the sound of Calypso. You start thinking about it. Last time you were there, you visualize all this stuff in your mind. Oh, I had such a great time. Think about the people you met. Mm, you're an alpha. The next level down is theta. Interesting. Theta is where the laws of the third dimension stop and where the laws of the multiverse engage. You see, when our brain operates in theta, which is between four and eight hertz per second, we can see into the future, we can see into the past, we can see across the cosmos. At delta, which is the lowest level, from zero to four hertz per second, we have out-of-body experiences. We can no longer define what is real and what is not real. You ever, you ever wake up and you say, wow, what a dream I just had. I couldn't even tell, I, I thought it was real until I woke up. Sure. Yeah, you, yeah, you were probably dreaming in, data, in delta. If you had an out-of-body experience, you were in delta. I was in a coma in Westchester County Hospital, New York. An entity came to me while I was in a coma and said, come with me. The next thing I knew I was about, my consciousness was about mm, 50, 75 miles away. I was looking down from the ceiling, watching the birth of my youngest child in real time. As soon as the child was born, I was back in the hospital in my body. I was happy, I was content. When I came to some hours later, my mother was standing over me. I said, Ma, you gotta make a phone call. The baby was born. The woman had the most confused look on her face. Her son just comes out of a coma. And the first words out of his mouth is the baby was born. Yeah. She came back. She said, Congratulations, you have you have a son. So awesome. yeah. Now we get to see things like that. You see, that is the non physical part of the 10 dimensions in which we live. You see, we think that the dimensions around us, the 8, 9, and 10, are the only real ones. No, these ones aren't even real. It's hard light. So why are we even here? You see, that's where the question comes in. Why are we even here? We've got to go back to Genesis. Let us create man in our image. Why? Well, we just created the third dimension. Dimensions 8, 9, and 10, the physical dimensions beyond the spatial planes. We should put somebody there who's part of us. And we'll have to give them physical bodies because this way they can interact with the physical world. But instead of letting Neanderthal or just other animals run around on the ground, let us make man in our image. And so we were given a perfect biological vessel. And then the breath of God was put in, inside of us. His consciousness. His image the image of the consciousness of the singularity. Let's go back. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, before me, there was nothing. After me, there will be nothing. Wait a minute. If nothing existed, a pure dynamic energy, what was it that changed this pure dynamic energy into everything that we have today? We have to kind of use a little poetic license here. We have to assume that this energy, this pure dynamic energy, which is the singularity, and we can prove this using mathematics now, the pure dynamic energy, this singularity, had to be conscious because we're conscious. It had to be able to think because we can think. If we're made in its image, guess what? It does the same things we do, just on a much more grand scale. So what was it that changed this pure dynamic energy, this pure dynamic conscious energy, into everything that we have around us today? It came up with a concept. A fantastic concept. The most incredible concept in, in ever to come up with. It was the concept of love. What a great idea. The more you give, the better you feel. The more you get, the better you feel. And you can love things on so many different levels. You can love your dog. You can love your car. You can love your kids. You can love your parents. You can love your family. You can love that significant other like no one else can. You see? And, and so it's that love that separates us from everything else. Not just the love, but the, the ability to plan, to see the future and then make it happen. Show me what animals, just other than a beaver, builds anything other than a burrow. And a beaver builds a dam because he's programmed to. He's hardwired to build a dam. I don't care where you take that beaver, put him in any part of the country, he's gonna use wood and mud to build a dam. That's as far as he's ever gonna get in his technology. However, Humans have split the atom. Not only have we split the atom, we're now dissecting the atom at CERN. We've built equipment that will decode the universe itself. 
We have changed this planet to the point that we are now destroying it, and it is in return destroying us. We have gotten to the point of drastic change. For millions of years, nothing happened on planet Earth. Humans come along, all of a sudden, Earth is in trouble. Why? Let us go back. When we go back to creation, where God said, let us make a helper for man, and he brings this woman, when we read the account, it says that they were naked. Cool. Some, <laughs> of, us like to be Some of us like to be naked with the opposite sex. It's a lot of fun. Anyway, they were good with it. We're usually good with it. If we're naked with somebody else, what are we generally doing? Making love. Where would we be? In Alpha. Is there any fear? No. But what happens? You see, they're running around naked. And the woman comes to this entity that says it's a serpent. A reptilian? Yeah. And the reptilian says, hey, you know what? If you want to try some of this fruit, it's good. It'll make you just like God. Oh, but we're not supposed to eat it. We'll die if we eat it. Nah, it's a bunch of baloney. You'll know right from wrong. God knows you'll be just like him. So they eat this fruit. Now what happens? They eat the fruit and they realize, uh-oh, we're naked. And they weren't good with it anymore. And then they hear the voice of God and they become afraid and they hide. They're not in alpha anymore. They're in beta. Guess what? The reptilians are beta testing earth. Yeah, they're beta testing earth. Why are they beta, beta testing earth? They're beta testing the free will of humans. See, we have free will. We can do whatever we want. Sometimes we break the law because we do what we want. As a matter of fact, most of us break the law every day and don't even realize it because they've written so many laws and so many ways to try to control humans that just by our very being, we break the law. But the only way you couldn't break the law is if you were dead. <laughs> Yeah, seriously. And so what happens? Well, when you're dead, the vessel becomes useless and it is buried. But what happens to the, to the occupant of the vessel? According to the scriptures, it goes back to God. How many people have you talked to that have had near-death experience that I was, death, I was dead? I was dead. I seriously was. Do you remember was going through a tunnel, seeing light? Oh, not so much a tunnel. Uh, what had happened is one second I was in my body knowing that I was going to die, and the next second I was out of my body knowing I was dead. Now, when I was in my body, everything, everything was color. I could still see color, but once I was out of my body, everything was black and white. And it was my consciousness that was out of my body. My consciousness was enveloped in this cloudy-looking substance. And I was physically being pulled away from my body. In other words, I wasn't just there watching myself dead. I was being pulled away from my body, just like somebody was dragging me backwards. And I was under massive protest. I'd j just gotten married a month before. I mentioned about my kid. <laughs> you know, so, so I'd started a new chapter in my life, basically. And now I was dying. And I didn't like it one bit. Now, I wasn't terrified or afraid. I was angry in protest. Like, no, this can't be happening. I was in denial, basically. But when, my, when I saw that I had no choice, I was just being pulled further and further, getting further and further away from my body. I, said, I, fa I just accepted it and said, well, this is it. And then I, my consciousness turned. I said, well, let's see where I'm going to because I'm being pulled away from my body. But I didn't know where I was going to at the time. And when my consciousness changed and I looked at where I was going, I was actually headed for the great white light. I was connected. This white substance of which was making up my body that my consciousness was enveloped in was directly connected to the great white light. And it was pulling me in. It was like a river just flowing into this white light. And I could feel the force. I could feel it pulling me. And then all of a sudden it stopped. And then it reversed and it pushed me back. I remember thinking, wow, I'm not, maybe I won't be dead. It's pushing me back. And I wound up in my body. I don't know how long it was before I came to. Uh, but yeah, that was the experience. Now, I've interviewed people who have been through near-death experiences or been dead. And I've listened to lots of interviews. And the one thing that's consistent is that no two near-death experiences are the same. We all have something different, something that is more agreeable to our psyche, I guess. But everybody experiences something different. So why? They all die, but they all experience something different. The answer can only be it's an effort to comfort us as we pass over. We all have memories of it, but we all remember something different. Generally, the white light is in there somewhere. But I had no angels there, no, rel no dead relatives. It was just me being drawn in, my energy being drawn into this great white light. So that was my experience. However... As I said, everybody has a different experience. I was put back in my body. 
Some of us, when we're not, we go and our body dies, ages, and that's the end. It's put into the ground. But what happens to the consciousness? What happens to the soul? Well, according to the church, you burn in hell if you're bad. Really? How does that work? How does fire work outside the third dimension? How do you burn something that's not much more than a thought? It's lunacy. Well, it says that in the Bible. Well, wait a minute. Let's take a look at what it says. It says, yeah. It talks about this light that, fi that burns with fire and sulfur. It says that the, the great reptilian or the great dragon is thrown into it. The wild beast is thrown into it. And the false prophet is thrown into this lake. And death itself is thrown into this lake. So guess what? This burning hell symbolizes eternal destruction from which nothing will come back. And the, the idea of a hellfire comes from the translation of the word uh, sheol or uh, in Greek into the word Hades in, I'm sorry, Sheol in Hebrew, which is translated into the word Hades in Greek, which now takes on the uh, image of the god Hades, who is a god over a fiery tor place of torment. So the Sheol with, which, with, uh, in Hebrew, which means grave or hole in the ground into which a dead body is thrown, it's all Sheol means. However, Hades is a place that of torment by the Greek god Hades, who torments souls. And so the church, which is supposed to represent Christ, adopted the Greek Hades version. You know why? Take a guess why. Fear because control. It's, it, yeah, fear control, and it's sold. You see, when, you start, when they started threatening the congregation with burning in hell with, with the Greek Hades and the Greek hell version, people started paying money to stay out of hell. And so the church started selling indulgences. They started making money. And that pissed off people like Martin Luther saying, you guys are lying to the people and then stealing their money. And so he started a revolution of which my family was part of 500 years ago, which I'm still part of today. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> it's amazing how the world turns. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And so here we have the, tr the church, which isn't giving a message from the Bible. It's taking the alien side of this, worshiping a god, Lucifer. These aren't gods. Let's go back. These are alien life forms. In Letters to Earth, You Can Survive Armageddon, the book in which I wrote, I put together a very interesting proposal based on the information at hand. And I proposed, and I wanted, I wanted to just point this out. I started writing Letters to Earth nine years ago. It was published seven years ago. Uh, in it, in it I, I make the argument that Satan, Lucifer, the devil, was actually the genetic engineer in charge of creating or genetically engineering life within the third dimension. The reason for that is a little scripture that nobody ever pays attention to in Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel. It's actually co covers a, a complete chapter, but in that chapter, I believe it's chapter oh, 38, I want to say, interesting, so many interesting scriptures in different places, but uh, in it, it talks about the king of Sire, and the, uh, Sidon, rather, and the king of Tyre. These two are two uh, cities which still exist today on the uh, eastern Mediterranean uh, one is in northern uh, Israel, the other one is in southern Lebanon. And uh, it talks about uh, these two kings as being beautiful, wonderful kings. And then they became self-centered, hoardy, self-absorbed in their own glory and, and uh, became vile. And it makes the comparison to this entity which is called the covering cherub of Eden. Now about three, four years ago, Remember I pointed out, I, I wrote Letters to, it was published, Letters to Earth, Letters to Earth was published in 2009. Uh, about four years ago, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the Galactic Federation of Light shows up and they say, we were your makers. We made you guys. We genetically engineered you. And our leader is named Lucifer. I'm like, get out of town. Seriously, you guys plagiarized my book. Seriously? Lucifer is your leader and you guys genetically engineered us? Thank you for reading Letters to Earth, You Can Survive Armageddon. Yes, I hit the nail on the head. You see, if they're back, they're not back as friends. These are the entities that started the beta test. These are the entities that have caused billions of lives throughout millennia. These are the entities that are trying to control us as their pets. Now think about this for a second. I'm gonna play devil's advocate. We're like they're lemmings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. Uh, well, here's the thing. This is the physical dimension. 
So we take everything as being physical. We don't pay, we have been brainwashed and and because we only live, you go back and, and we read, remember I said science believes that the world was static. They teach us as if the world was static, nothing's yeah. changing in it. Well, we go, we look at our lifespan today and say, oh, he died at 80 years old. He lived, lived a good life. My grandfather died at 86. My grandmother died at 95. And I have an aunt that died at 101. Yeah, they lived fantastic lives. I'm glad about that. That means I'm a little bit more than halfway through. <laughs> I still right? got a lot of years to go. However, people that I went to school with are already dead. So, you know, we don't live very long. Why? Well, because our DNA is messed up. Why? Because of the beta test. You see, there very well could have been something within that fruit, that proverbial fruit, that destroyed our DNA. My guess is that it had a virus, a telomere virus. Our DNA was probably connected at the ends. In other words, it wasn't linear strands. They were, it looked more like an infinity sign. And so when it would replicate, it wouldn't come apart at the ends. If it was connected, it wouldn't come apart. But what happens? There are telomeres at the ends of our DNA. Telomeres are like the little plastic ends on your shoelaces. You lose the little plastic end, the shoelace unravels. Okay. Well, the telomere stops the DNA from unraveling. However, every time the DNA splits, we lose a set of telomeres. When you run out of telomeres, the DNA unravels and we die. It's just that simple. But if the telomeres, if the DNA was connected and we didn't have the telomeres as an interrupter, we'd never die, would we? Not if the DNA just kept on reproducing itself and reproducing itself and reproducing itself. You see, if it was connected at the ends, like an infinity sign, it would just reproduce itself. It would never go bad. But it's got telomeres on the end. And when we run out of the telomeres, it goes bad and we die. So it could have very well been that that fruit contained a virus full of tel a telomere virus, which, it, which literally attached itself to our DNA. Now, we do have viruses today that attach themselves to our DNA. The herpes virus is a real good one. You get that, you got it for life. Why? Because it attaches itself to, to your DNA. And every time your DNA replicates, so does the herpes virus. Just that simple. Uh, you can be eradicated. It can be dealt with. But actually, the one thing that they can use doesn't have to eliminate uh, the herpes virus doesn't have a patent anymore. It's a little chemical called BHT. It's put in almost everything. They've been using it for 30 years. But because there's no patent on it, Nobody puts it into a drug because then they'd have to spend millions of dollars in drug testing in something that doesn't have a patent, which means anybody could sell it. So like so many other medicines that are out there, they know it can cure us. They don't. And they let us suffer. However, we have to look deeper at ourselves. And this is where, this is where we're going to kind of like shift gears here a little bit. We are, when we go back to the original story, uh, we have this entity, this covering cherub of Eden, this reptilian, who poisons us. Now, once that happens, we die. So the, the knowledge that the last generation had can no longer be passed down to this generation. Whatever my grandfather forgot to teach me before he died has been lost. That organic intelligence is gone forever. And we no longer follow organic intelligence. We follow artificial intelligence. And so, so we have smartphones with apps that do our thinking for us. And if we took anybody out of the city just randomly pick somebody who lives in the city who lives by their smartphone or by their computer, and we all pretty much do anymore. And we dropped them in the middle of the forest and said, took their smartphone away and said, you're on your own, buddy. Wish you well. That person would probably starve to death within a week if they didn't kill themselves from madness before. before. Yet, we used to tribally eke out a living from the very forest, an untouched, positive organic forest. We used organic intelligence knowing, hey, guess what? I saw this bird today. You know, the geese fly north in the winter. I mean, in the summer, you know, summer's coming. They fly south in the winter, you know, winter's coming. Or in the fall, rather. You know, you, that organic intelligence, leaves are changing, winter's coming, it's going to get cold. Now, we all know that. It's all given, that, 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 that's just obvious. However, can you go into the woods and can you find food to survive? Can you find, eat, do you know what to eat that will not kill you and what to eat that will kill you? Or do you know how to take something that will kill you and prepare it in a way to, to make it detox, to get all the toxins out of it so you can eat it? You see, we forgot all that. We don't know what's edible and what's not edible. Where's my Autobahn guide to plants in North America? We got to check this. You see, we got to go back to 
somebody else's intelligence. And yet, this is something that we all learned, all took for granted once upon a time. Building something. How many people can actually go outside and build something? Yet, people built their own farms, their own houses, their own camps out of the wilderness. People came to this country on wooden ships and landed. There weren't any Walmarts. There weren't any uh, Starbucks. There, there, there wasn't a TGI Fridays. Well, they're almost out of business anyway, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this whole planet's almost out of business for that matter. <laughs> well, I, I got to jump in real quick if I can, because sure. I'm thinking of the industrial age and how it's really just depleted the Earth's resources just so quickly. And then you look at the nuclear reactors, the industrial waste plants, all the pollution and environmental destruction that has been caused over the past, let's just say, 150 years. It seems as if maybe at the very top levels, whether it be an extraterrestrial presence or some type of spiritual presence, it seems like these entities have everything orchestrated. So as you say right now, most people would have no idea how to live on their own if they were put out into the wilderness. I mean, just watch Remote Survival on Netflix and you can see these people, they're supposedly all gung-ho and have the abilities and, and just, they're ready to go, live off the land. And they, they crumble miserably many times. Oh yeah, unless you're trained, unless you've been trained in survival techniques. Even people who are trained by the military will tell you it's not easy. It's yeah. difficult. However, this all used to be organic knowledge. You know, once upon a time, little kids would run into the woods and go have dinner. You know, they knew what to pick and eat. Right. But we've lost that ability. Now, kids hardly even go out anymore. When you brought up the fact that your neighbor kid actually plays basketball, I said, my, you know, I was thinking to myself, that's amazing. Most kids are just playing video games all day. Yeah, uh, I saw something on TV that that blew. I, I didn't actually watch it. I was just scrolling through the channels late last night just to see what was on, and I came across it was on uh, one of the sports channels. It was a sporting event being done uh, via. It was like who was the best at 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 computer golf or whatever that it was. <laughs> Seriously, I'm thinking. You know, I thought that making poker, uh, putting poker on the sports channel. I thought that was insane. Now they're having geek contests at, at universities playing computer games you know like computer football this team against that team and which are are you serious pick up a ball blow it up and get out on the gridiron put the computer down that they, they, they're having what sports is now going to computer operators that's insane they having cons yeah it's like okay what 100 years from now we're gonna have a, a t two teams of geeks sitting down at their computers playing the super bowl they're programming their robots. Here we go. Robot 15. It just yelled, hey, he's fading back. He's going to throw it long. <laughs> ah, he's been tackled. You know, it's like, oh, seriously? Is it, what happened to the physical interaction? You see, we stopped physically interacting with life. When we stop physically interacting with life, that's usually called death. It seems like we're in some type of matrix almost anymore, it even is. more so, because it, even if you look out at the skies right now, when it's a blue sky day and there's no clouds, it's not like it used to be. There's still no chemtrails. Well, even then, there's I, I see plenty of no chemtrail days out here in San Antonio, but even those days, the sky, it's just like this silvery blue. It, it's almost like it's not natural. The atmosphere itself, maybe they've put so much stuff into the atmosphere that it's created some type of like reflection network, nanotype tech, where you're not going to be able to see the now, blue why sky would they, like it was Why would ago. they do that? Why would they do that? Well, I mean, Think there's a million this. reasons to do that. You know, obviously, uh, to no, hide no, no, things no. from us, to control the yeah, weather. Oh, well, let's go back. Hide things from us and control the weather. What dictates the weather pattern on besides HARP? What's that? I said, I said, what dictates the weather patterns on Earth besides HARP? And we can do that now with HARP. If you're not familiar with, with folks, if you're not familiar with HARP, look it up. H A A R P. Uh, I'm sure most of our listeners are. Yeah, I mean HARP in the controlling the weather, the the jet streams as well. Yeah, and they create they create earthquakes in one place after another. However, I don't think that there's that much energy in all of the HARP machines uh, to affect the patterns that we're seeing now. You see, the biggest weather changer is the sun. So something, it's what happens to the sun that dictates what happens here on Earth. Now, l let's, let's digress. You brought up something really good. You went from, we went from the industrial age into the technical age. You see, for t hundreds of thousands of years, humanoids used horses and other animals as main means of conveyance. Uh, for about the last 6,000 years, we've got great documentation using horses and elephants. 
about a hundred, about two hundred years ago, we started to come up with steam power. And then steam power was the dominant power for about a hundred years. And then we started to gasoline or oil power took over slowly. And then we went from oil power to uh, nuclear power. Now, the interesting thing is that when we go back, th th there have been two very significant changing points in history. Every history historian worth his salt will tell you that the first changing point, the first thing that changed our history was World War I. The second thing that changed world, world history was 9-11, the 9-11 event. The World Trade Center being taken down by, by cavemen and rag in towels that, that that use box cutters to hijack sophisticated airplane jet, jet liners and fly them into buildings. Well, the box cutters had yeah. alien technology. Yeah, I'm sure they were laser box cutters. Yeah, laser box cutters. <laughs> yeah, they were able to make the the buildings collapse within their own footprint. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, in a free fall, <laughs> a, a, a concrete and steel building just all of a sudden decides to free fall. Isn't that amazing? Uh, but anyway, we could, th th if you're still amazed by the 9-11 events and haven't figured out that we, that we did it to ourselves and the reasons why, then you shouldn't be listening to this show. <laughs> That's ancient history. <laughs> yeah, this is a little advanced for them, maybe. Yeah, because we're beyond that. We're at the next step. You see, one thing's for sure. We had all this technology, and up to World War I, all of a sudden the technology changes. Now, it's interesting. You know when the first documented crash of an alien spacecraft was? in recent, what we would call recent it was in history. 30s, wasn't it? Actually, 1897, in Aurora, Texas, it's alleged that the local newspaper read that uh, said that uh, an alien spacecraft had crashed, the, the occupant died, they buried the, the, the occupant and got rid of the wreckage. Whatever happened to the wreckage, I don't know. Now, did it really happen? I don't know. They wrote it up in the newspaper for some reason. Now, I'll tell you what did happen in 1897. The first Congress of Zion happened in 1897 in Basel, Switzerland, and out of the first Congress of Zion came the Letters of the Protocol of Learned Elders of Zion, or the Protocol of the Learned Elders of Zion, which has been claimed to be a plagiarized fraud. Uh, exactly how that works, I'm not sure. How do you plagi Why would anybody plagiarize a fraud? But Henry Ford thought it was pretty real. He had 500,000 copies printed in, two, in 1922 and sent to all of his friends and compadres, and then he ran... Uh, a year-long serial of the complete uh, Protocol of the Learned Elders of Zion in the Dearborn Express. I believe that was the name of his paper, Dearborn, Miss Michigan. So all his factory workers could read uh, the Sunday edition uh, that would contain uh, a page of in a, a page excerpt from the letters uh, from the Protocol of the Learned Elders of Zion. Now, if you've not read it, I suggest don't bother. Read Letters to Earth because in chapters, and this is why Letters to Earth got me in trouble. In chapters uh, ten and eleven, I talk about. I'm sorry, chapters uh, ten and eleven. Yeah, chapters ten and eleven. I talk about the protocol and in ten, and I, and I go into depth and take it apart in chapter uh, chapter eleven, and show exactly how it applies to today. It's like a blueprint for the twentieth and twenty first century. It is capturing the banks, capturing the financial system. It is destroying God. It is getting rid of the church, which is what we're seeing now. Right now, the, the, the Catholic Church is fighting for its own existence. Uh, there's another show there. We're not going to have enough time to get into it, but it is fighting for its own existence. That's why uh, we have a Jesuit pope that goes totally against uh, uh, the Catholic law, Vatican law. No Jesuits are ever supposed to become pope. Uh, we still have a, we had a Pope that retired, first time that's happened in over 600 years. The Pope that we got, interestingly enough, in 2010, October 2010, I called this date. I said the dates that we need to watch out for are 313-13 and 414-14. We got Pope Francis on 313-13, the first Jesuit Pope. Uh, the first thing he started to do is attack the financial debt system. And on October 2nd, uh, 2013, he wrote a 41-page treatise, which I thought was a suit for peace to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It wasn't. It was a suit of peace to Lucifer for the very existence of the church. That's why the church signed that document with Marduk. The church knows it's about to be exterminated because we don't need gods. The one thing that shows up when aliens show up, what do you need religion for? Especially when they say we created you and you got it all wrong. You see, that, that negates religion right away. And the fact is, science will support the evidence in the Bible. You need science to understand what's written in the scriptures. 
Science will never support religious dogma. Neither will the Bible support religious dogma. It's not there. It's just not in there. That's, you see, once you add religious dogma, then people say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. Try adding science. The Bible will never contradict itself once you add science in. Now, where we are in the stream of time, we got aliens. We got Planet X, Nibiru. We got a sun that seems to be out of control. We got earthquakes happening one place after another. We've got global warming going on for some reason. The ocean levels are rising. It's not the reasons that they're giving us. Why are they spraying barium and aluminum particles in the air? See, because they're not just barium and aluminum particles. They're now nuclear radiated barium and aluminum particles with Fukushima radiation. Fukushima has four nuclear reactors in total meltdown. They will never be able to stop that. The people in Tokyo have been fully irradiated. I just read an article about a, less than a month ago by the former mayor, by the former premier of, uh, of Japan who was ready to evacuate Tokyo, but he knew that if he evacuated Tokyo, he would literally be, be destroying his own country. So they gave the false story that, no, there's no radiation in Tokyo, everybody's safe. Meanwhile, everybody's gonna die of cancer there, virtually most people will eventually. But he allowed Fukushima to irradiate Japan so Japan could maintain, maintain its status as a world economic power. Think about that. If he would have evacuated Japan, Tokyo, that would have been the end of, Japan, of the Japan's economic system. It would have been over for Japan. Now they're number three as opposed to being number two as far as economic powers. The United States still number one, China's number two. That is not going to go away. Now, here's the situation. We get a Nibiru event. And that causes the sun to throw out an EMP. And it shuts down the electric grid not just of the United States, but of the planet. There are going to be over 440 nuclear reactors that go into meltdown. They only had, at the best nuclear sites, they only have enough backup fuel to last for about six months. At six months' time, six months after they shut a nuclear reactor down, there is still enough heat generated within the nuclear core itself that it only is going to take twice as long to go into, into meltdown. Instead of a few hours, it's going to take about a day before it goes into meltdown. So they have to continually cool those reactors throughout the whole period until they can get the electric grid back up. Now, here's an interesting thing. I was talking to an engineer just last week, uh, and he had made the statement. This is an, an MIT graduate. For the little, little bit more than the cost of a B-2 bomber, B-2 stealth bomber, they can harden every major transformer in the United States so that we don't have to worry about an EMP, whether it's from some little midget madman in North Korea who wants to launch a nuke over here or whether Kim it's from the sun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, either way, for a little more than the cost of a B-2 stealth bomber, we can make the United States blackout proof from an EMP. Now, if you, can, if you remember, in 2013, in November, the United States did a grid test, a test of the electric grid to see where the soft spots were, so to speak, where its vulnerability was. The reason why they did the test is because a study said that with the, if they, within two years of the electric grid going down, 90% of the population of the United States would be dead. Think about that. We get an EMP, it puts down the electric grid, and, and they don't get it back up and running. In two years, 90% of the population of the United States would be dead. Why? Because we, there's no app to get out of a nuclear holocaust like that. There's no app to get out, and I say nuclear holocaust, that's what it'll turn into. We'll have 440 Fukushimas around the world. And that doesn't have, have to happen. But that's what we're being set up. It's all setting us up. Why? Why is the question I actually hate? The reason we're being set up is that we're headed for a dynamic change. We've got aliens. We've got a Nibiru event. We've got the Catholic Church that wants to become a one world religion. Why does the Catholic Church want to become a world religion? Religious heads of the world? Because the protocol of learned elders of Zion said that they are going to destroy religion and destroy God. So they are holding on. And they're willing to 
form a worldwide religion. And so the 41-page treatise that the, that the Pope uh, wrote on October, or issued October 2nd, 2013, was essentially a suit for peace, and it, and it became what we know today as the post-2015 development agenda for the United Nations. Why was the Pope in the United States speaking at the Capitol? Why was the Pope speaking at Independence Hall? Why was the Pope at the White House? I can understand the White House is kind of like a personal residence for the president. But the Pope in the Capitol, in a country that's prided itself on 200 years of separation of church and state? Why is the religious, head of the religious leaders, some religious organization, telling the people of the United States what they need to be doing at the governmental level? Why? Get that bum out of here. The reason is because the United States of America is the United States of America, Inc. It's a corporation as in everything. Everything has been incorporated or under admiralty law and is being controlled by the mother of all corporations, the Vatican. Two interesting things. We're under admiralty law. You know who invented admiralty law? The Canaanites. The Canaanites were the people that occupied the Holy Land before the nation of Israel came in. Now, Yahuwah, Yahweh, told the nation of Israel, wipe out the Canaanites, destroy them. Why? Because they were baby sacrificing Molech worshipers. They sacrificed their own children to the god Baal, who they had wild orgies for in the spring. Molech actually means horrible God. And in the fall or in the autumn, the first fruits of the orgy, the sexual orgy of the spring, were sacrificed to Molech. Archaeologists have found Canaanite sites of child sacrifice where they've recovered so much bone and, and fragments of, of infants and young children that they have wondered why God even let these Canaanites exist as long as he did. The Israelites didn't stamp out the Canaanites. The Canaanites spread admiralty law through the Phoenicians throughout the world. When General Titus came and destroyed, Israel, destroyed Jerusalem in 70 CE, took the uh, Molech worshiping Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jewish population of that time, back to Rome, they, all, they were all enslaved. They were all enslaved. And uh, those slaves eventually bought their way out of slavery by the end of the first century, and they became part of Roman society or European society. They went back to the Holy Land as the Knights Templars along with the Jesuit order. The Knights Templar, two riders on the same horse. Oh, well, they were poor. That's why they had to share the horse. Really? Well, then the king should have paid them more because knights are in servitude to the king. And it's the king's wealth that pays the knights. Knights are not poor. Knights were the millionaires of the medieval, of the medieval uh, period. They were the millionaires, not the billionaires, the millionaires. They worked for the billionaires. So you had millionaire knights with an order of Jesuits going to the Middle East. They capture Jerusalem. They, they, raise the, uh, they kill every man, woman, and child. They start digging under the Temple Mount. Whatever they find allows them to transform Europe from edifices of wood into stone buildings, the likes of which had not been seen since the early Roman days when that knowledge was organic and known. You see, it was whatever they found that allowed them to start in Jerusalem that was buried under the temple that allowed them to start to gain power over the rest of the world. Now, there's a difference in opinion on what was found, but one thing's for sure, they found knowledge. And they used that knowledge, and it was knowledge of Molech and Raphan. If we go to Acts, the 20, I'm sorry, the seventh chapter, the 42nd and 43rd verse, the disciple Stephen is standing before the Sanhedrin, which is the high court of Israel in Jerusalem. And he quotes the prophet Amos, who was speaking to the same people about 500, uh, about 700 years before. And he says, is speaking in the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel, he said, was it to me, O Israel, to whom you worship those 40 years in the wilderness? Now, this is when they come out of Egypt. It says, no, it was to Mo, the tent of Molech and to the star God Raphan, to whom you made idols and sacrifices to. And for that, I will send you far off beyond Babylon. Now, Rome, now, what had happened, the first, when Amos spoke those words, uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in, raised the city, took all the captives back to Babylon. The Medes and the Persians took them from Babylon to Persia before they wound up back in Israel again. So they went beyond Babylon, which is modern-day Iraq. Uh, when General Titus raised the city in 70, he took them back to Europe, where until 1947, 
and Israel became a state, did anybody actually start to go back to Palestine? Now, the interesting thing, I mentioned the, learned, uh, the uh, first Congress of Zion t uh, lining up with a, in 1897, lining, lining up with the UFO crash. When's the next UFO crash that we told about? Roswell, 1947. You know what, the, what we get the Roswell crash, right? You know what else happened in 1947? Not sure. The United Nations declared Israel a state. Hmm. Wait a minute. The protocol was to, now the whole reason for the protocol was to gain the Holy Land back, to get the Holy Land back. World War I happens, and in 1917, uh, Lord Balfour gets a request from Lord Rothschild that the Holy Land be, re be reserved as a Jewish homeland or as a fu future Jewish homeland. The Balfour Agreement becomes the Balfour Declaration in 1917, and the king signs off on it declaring Palestine the future home, home for the Jews. No Jewish people are going there, though. Why? They, they like Bavaria. The, tr the, the fact is that the first, the first uh, Congress of Zion was supposed to be held in Munich, Germany. But when the local population found out that the, their objective was to relocate Jews back to Palestine, there was such an uproar by the local Jewish population that they had to move the Congress to Basel, Switzerland. Think about that for a minute. They didn't want to go back. Well, they didn't go back after World War I, even though the English army captured uh, Palestine from, from the Turks. It was now in Christian hands again. Jerusalem was in Christian hands. How about that? First time in a thousand years, almost. It took the Second World War and a Holocaust to drive the Jews back to Israel. Oh, back to Palestine. And you see, Palestine is a big issue today. So is the nation of Israel. Now, what most people don't understand or have no clue of is that quietly, the Vatican has bought close to 70% of the city of, of Jerusalem. The Vatican owns 70, almost 70% 70 of the real estate in Jerusalem, including all of the real estate around the Temple Mount. Rome has laid siege once again to the city of Jerusalem. Think about that. Now, this is where it's, it's going to get interesting right here. Inter interesting. We have ISIS. We have all this, all this terrorism that's going on. We have the control of the banks controlling the countries. Uh, we're living in a time when we're facing annihilation by our own hand through pollution and destruction of the very planet. And we have alien life forms that people want to start worshiping again. Flat Earthers worshiping Anunnaki, Anu, the god of a flat Earth, a flat domed Earth. Oh. Uh, yeah, NASA's not really telling us the truth. The Earth is flat. It's all a conspiracy theory. All those pictures, you know, the sun's round, Mars is round, Jupiter's round, the moon's round, all the planets around except for Earth. Earth is flat. I yeah, know, you're man. all insane. <laughs> it's a trip, and and that's what makes me wonder sometimes. I mean, people have genuine interests in things, and and most of the time they want to do the right thing, and they feel like they've been lied to their whole lives. So they see this new idea out there that's different, and just because it's different, they're like, okay, you know, that's that's probably more likely it. So. Unfortunately, there's 90% disinformation and, you know, 5% truth and then 5% flat out BS, you know, I mean, whatever this, this that 5% you got to get to and, and shuffle through the other 95%, which can be very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of people, there's a lot of people in this truth movement today. They woke up after 9-11. I've done this since I was four years old, just um, before I was five is when the edu I was four and a half years old when my education started in, in this. I'm 60 today. Today's my birthday. I've been doing this for 56 years. This ain't new. I come from a family that was exterminated by that the Catholic Church tried to exterminate because we pulled this stunt 500 years ago. I should have been dead 16 times, was once, and got sent back. I did have, I've had alien contact. Shortly after my 18th birthday, I had alien contact. I thought, wow, this is fantastic. I'm eating aliens. Yeah, I the fourth or fifth time they told me they were going to kill me. Now, the interest, I was always suspe suspicious of these, quote, aliens. Interestingly enough, I was never taken to a spaceship. I was always taken underground. Now we know that it was Homo Capensis that lives underground that is controlling this planet. And that's just one of several different alien species. Several different alien species. 
So how was I able to survive death 16 times? Most of these can be documented. Some of them are really bizarre. Uh, 2010, I mentioned this earlier, when I found the information about 313, 13, 414, 14, I also found some other information that linked up to the book of Ezekiel to with something that a uh, retired major from NORAD, Major Stanley Fulham, who wrote the book Challenges of Change, said hey, we were going to go through a difficult time period and then aliens would help us on the other side. All this linked up. Now, I was the day that I was going to release this information, I was bringing my son back from college. It was a Friday evening. I'd driven on a road I'd driven over 100 times before, a beautiful road. Just set my cruise control for 63 miles an hour. I know exactly how fast I was going. And within 30, 60 seconds after I set my cruise control, a deer jumped out of the tree line and made, tried to leap over my car. While the deer was in midair, a blue orb appeared and stopped it from coming through the windshield of my car. You can go on my Facebook page and find the, the pictures there. I did post them. And, there's a round depression in the glass. Now I hit this deer and this deer was a, a big buck. I estimate the, the weight of well over 250 pounds, live weight, not dead weight, live weight. Huge deer, hit the glass and bounced off. Now there is a huge depression, did damage the glass, did damage part of the car, but he didn't come through. The lead off, the, the second story on the news on Monday morning was a family of three, hit a, door, a doe about 100 pounds, doing 45 miles an hour. That deer went through the front windshield and out the back, put all three of them in the hospital in critical condition. This deer bounced off my windshield. And what was that blue orb? A blue orb, as the deer is in midair, a blue orb suddenly appears out of nowhere, blows up like a balloon and absorbs the impact. We are not alone. I got to see the hand of God itself. You see, here's the situation. We are so powerful and we have been reduced to being little moronic idiots that'll believe anything, including that the earth is flat. We have given our power to religious leaders, to political leaders, and to everybody except ourselves. And yet we are made in the image of the creative force of the multiverse itself. We are the children of God. The problem is, cosmically speaking, we don't live past a cosmic hour. How much does an infant learn in the first hour of its birth? It learns where its mother's tit is, and that's it. It learns where it can feed from, and that's it. It that learns, it learns to cry and get what it yeah. wants. It, it learns that, it's not, <laughs> well, it hasn't gotten that far. It just knows that it's not happy. It's right. not happy. It's not where it was. Let me and, back and, where I was. <laughs> yeah. You know, every guy, has, since he's been kicked out, has been trying to get back in. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, it, it, we're not happy once we're outside of that environment. And now we've been kicked out of the our Mother Earth essentially. We are no longer in harmony with our Mother Earth, and it's hurting us physically. But look, cosmically speaking, we don't make it past our first hour of cosmic birth. How much can we learn about this world and about the universe and about the multiverse, about the 10 dimensions that must be here that we live in? It's not just three dimensions. We're not three dimensional beings. We are 10 dimensional beings just by our very existence, which makes us seven parts spiritual, three parts physical. Guess where our power lies? Not in the physical end. Our power lies in the spiritual end. It lies in those other seven spatial planes. That's how we are able to create our own futures. You see, once we start taking this creative power back and start saying, no, I don't give a rat's hiney who's running for president. You're all a bunch of liars anyway, and you're making the rules up as you go. I'm not giving my power to that crap. Or you turn around and say, why do I need to go to this idiot who rapes children and confess my sins to him to get a better standing with my father, the creator? What are you, insane? I have to go confess my sins to this guy who just raped my kid or your kid? Seriously? Where do a half a million children go every year? You know those little faces on the back of the milk cartons? 750 children out of the United States disappear every year. They recover about 250 of them, either dead or kidnapped by kids, by, by their parents, children kidnapped by, you know, the other spouse, family member. But there's a half a million children which just vanish, never to be seen or heard from again. And yes, Moloch worship and child sacrifice is alive and well on this planet. It's being done to placate these aliens. Remember the Twilight Zone movie? Oh, yeah. To, ser to serve man, it was a cookbook. When we go back to some of the documents that are, that are supposed to be written 
or agreed to between Eisenhower and the aliens and Truman and the aliens. They agreed to give us technology. We agreed to give them humans. Think about that. If that's true, then we have to consider all the other things that the whistleblowers have told us. And if that's the case, then there are aliens on the moon. There's alien, not alien aliens, cloned alien armies. But we're dealing with interdimensionals. We go back to the Book of Enoch and we can get some kind of uh, input on this. Remember, it's not just the physical. The physical is nothing but hard light. It's what goes beyond the physical that's important. There's just not so much information to pack into two, into two hours. It's just crazy. But here's where I want to, we will pick this up again. And, and we can do this even earlier, whenever you want. You know, midday is usually pretty easy for me. Most of the, most of the, most of the time, I'm involved in the evening. Lots of people want me on their, their nighttime shows. Okay. But, he, but here's the situation, and this is where I want to end at. We are God's children. We are the children of the creator, which means we are creators ourselves. We have nothing to fear. You see, even though we might be under admiralty law, once we claim relationship or start that personal relationship back to the singularity of the cosmos, I'm not talking about some alien Anunnaki god. I'm talking about the creative power of the complete 10-dimensional multiverse in which we live. Once we accept that we are children, then we can start taking our power back. But not only that, you see, this is exopolitical. It also puts us on the right side because we are no longer aligning ourselves with the alien force that started this rebellion 6,000 years ago and started beta testing Earth. It's a beta test of our free will. Do we want to do we want to serve the Anunnaki? Do we want to serve the greys, the reptilians, these other life forms that are showing up here saying we're here to help you? Or do we want our independence and do we want our planet back? Which do we want? It's just that simple. You see, we can control these life forms. We don't have to put up with them. We can command these life forms using the name of Yahuwah, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus, Yeshua. These names have power. Why? Because of the exopolitical meaning behind them. There's a cosmic meaning. And in these words, we can use to control every single one of these alien life forms because we are that powerful. We connect, we, we can connect to the source of all energy at those other seven spatial planes. Fear keeps us out of that. Fear keeps us locked into this physical world. When we can get out of that physical fear and start drawing our own spiritual power, we feel good. We feel great. We feel powerful. We don't feel like a victim. Now we gain the strength. And when we use those names, you ever see the, you ever see the movie When Mars Attacks? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. We come in peace. We come in peace. <laughs> yeah, right. You you yell Yahuwah loud enough and you'll make their heads explode. I promise you. Nice. Yes. That is the type of power that we have. And they don't want us to know it because if we use this power, we'll destroy their facade. We'll bring down their corrupt system like a curtain falling. And that's exactly where I'm going to leave off. With that, I'm going to say love and blessings to all. Have a fantastic life. We'll be back to talk more about this. Go to my website. Join me on Facebook, Peter Kling, K L I N G dot com. On Facebook, just look me up, Peter Kling. I'll be there. Uh, there's a lot more coming down, and there's a lot that we have to know. But it's simple, it's not complicated, and it all revolves around love. That's the great part. We don't have to fight, we don't have to pick up arms. It all revolves around love. Because when we are in Alpha, we can now grab that power and use it to defend ourselves against any and all people who attack us, whether they are human or non-human. We are the children of the Creator. Use your power wisely, folks. Love and blessings to all. Read letters to Earth. You can survive Armageddon. Well said. Really appreciate you coming on the show with us. We'll definitely stay in touch. And folks, make sure to go to peterkling.com. to some great articles up there. And awesome book. I got to tell you, I've gone through that book a couple of times and some really good information. So stay safe. Be the change you want to see, folks. Inside the Borg, outside the hive mind. This is Rex Bear with Leak Project. Take care.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us this edition of Leak Project. I am your host, Rex Bear, and we have a special guest with us tonight that is very knowledgeable with biblical prophecies, Peter Klink. Peter began his Bible education at the age of five and never really stopped. As he trained to become a scientist, he began to discover amazing answers to many of the biblical questions. He is working on a follow-up book right now that will explore humanity's connection with a higher power and the spiritual world. Currently, Peter lives in Milford, Pennsylvania, and has been in several different editions of Who's Who throughout his educative and professional life. Now this is a quote from Peter. My research started almost 30 years ago. A thought came to me one day, if the Bible was really written for the generation who were living in the last days, then there should be plenty of evidence that could be proven either scientifically or historically and free from religious dogma. I was right. I found what I was looking for. End quote. Peter, it's a pleasure to have you on the show here with us tonight here at The Leak Project. How's it going? Very good, Rex. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. Absolutely. You know, I mean, you've just done so much research and your website, peterkling.com, has several videos, uh, current events, topics, and a lot of knowledge uh, with biblical prophecy and what we were talking about a moment ago before the show started, the ET phenomenon. Uh, I asked you before the show if you thought some of these pictures taken from the Soho telescopes that you can see what looks like these giant spaceships, kind of Star Trek style, if, if those were the ETs you were referring to that we had to worry about. And you said, no, they don't use spaceships. I was wondering if you could touch on that. Yeah, sure. You know, it, it all has to do with really who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and what our future is. And the one thing, that the biggest thing that we face is that we only live at the most, maybe 100 years. Most of us don't make it to that. Most of us don't see 70 to 75. However, a few do, but still only at 100 years, we are, not, we are cosmic infants, cosmic newborns. So we virtually know nothing about the cosmos. Our scientists have based everything on a static Earth. In other words, the Earth has always been like this. Well, it hasn't always been like this, and we haven't always been here. Uh, we have so much battling back and forth between science and religion, and it goes actually beyond that because science doesn't have it completely right, and religion, forget religion, has it, doesn't have it right at all. Uh, but when you combine the two, you start to get some real answers. And it's, it was after a couple of things led to this. I actually was in a debate. I was uh, about 26 at the time. I was in a debate. I took the biblical end of creation, uh, and I went up against somebody who took evolution. And the best I could do is stalemate them. And I felt that as a, I took that as a loss. And I felt badly afterwards. It's like I came away and I, I didn't win. And if you don't win, you lose, right? right. So there, was no, there were no clear winners. There were no clear losers. It was, it was a stalemate. It was, it, we got to the point where we, you had to agree to disagree. However, it wasn't too long after that that I realized something in reading a passage out of Job. It's Job the, in the Job, the uh, 38th chapter, I believe it's the, 20, around the 20th verse, 21st verse. Okay. God is, at, God is asking Job, have you seen my storehouses of snow and ice, which I have saved for the day of distress and war? And I'm thinking, what did Job know about snow and ice, especially warehouses of it? Where would these warehouses be? And I learned to meditate, active meditation, in the style of Edgar Casey. And I looked through the eyes of Job, and I saw mountaintops covered with snow. And I said, no, nah, that can't be storehouses. And then I moved myself away from Earth as if I was traveling away from Earth. And I'd see more mountaintops with more snow. And then all of a sudden, I realized <gasps> the warehouses are at the poles. Well, how do you use ice as a weapon? Either you create more of it, or you shrink it, melt it. And if you melt it, what happens is that that weight redistributes around the world, and we wind up having earthquakes in one place after another, just as Jesus said in the prophecy of Matthew 24. So I'm thinking, hmm, that was the key. It was, if we live in the last days, then there has to be scientific proof. And so that's what I did. I started looking for the scientific support. Now, I found it right away. Genesis 2, 21 through 23, God says, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to create a helper for him. Now, pay attention to this. 
he causes a sleep to come over the man. He opens up the flesh. He removes a rib tissue sample. He closes the flesh and he proceeds to make a, a woman out of the rib that he took from the man. And he brings the woman to the man and the man says, at last, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bones. This one was taken from man. I shall call her woman. Adam knew that he was speaking to his cloned twin sister. So who were the genetic engineers? You see, his tissue sample was taken. It was sent down to genetic engineering. Simple operation was performed. The flesh was opened. The tissue sample was removed. The flesh was closed. It even says the sleep came over the man. He was anesthetized. So who were the genetic engineers? You see, once we ask who were the genetic engineers, then you got to ask, well, why did they put us here? What's the whole purpose? Why are we here? And if the gods put us here, then why are things so screwed up? We've got to take a step back of Genesis, the first chapter. It says, let us make man in our image. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because I have referred to that reference before with, um, you know, trying to have a, a decent debate in this subject because of person's beliefs and my beliefs, obviously. And um, they always say, oh, well, that's the Trinity. That's the Son, the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, am I wrong? No, that's religious dogma that you just mentioned. It, it, it's it, and, and we'll get into a little bit of that. Let us create man in our image. Okay. When we look at the fossil record, we have a record that goes back all the way to cyanobacteria, extremophile bacteria, bacteria that can live in an extreme environment. And they find these bacteria on the planet today. Like they go to places like Yellowstone and you got bubbling cauldrons of 212 degree water and the stuff that lives inside of that water. You have water that's extremely acidic or extremely caustic and stuff lives inside that water. It's their home. So what's the connection between us and them? Well, scientists now have figured out, genetic engineers have now figured out by unraveling the human genome, our DNA contains all the information to recreate all life on this planet, right down to the cyanobacteria. Think about that. Hence, humans are the pinnacle of creation or the pinnacle of genetic engineering. You see, because scientists go, who go by this theory, and it's still a theory of evolution, have no explanation for how the Cambrian period started. Let me, let, let's talk about the Cambrian period for a second. Prior to the Cambrian period, which is about 500, 500 million years ago, according to the fossil record, uh, prior to that, there were only simple life forms, bacteria. The most complicated life on the planet was a jellyfish. That was it. And then we get to uh, the Cambrian period and life explodes on this planet. There's so much life on this planet, such a variety of life, not just the amount, but the variety. This, there has never been that variety on this planet ever since. We have only gone through extinction level events, approximately five major ones. We're now facing extinction event number six. You know, with that said, there's a lot of speculation that there's this binary star system that is taking its orbit, getting very close to Earth right now. And I've interviewed some people that are very well versed in the subject. Uh, you know, we've talked to Steve Olson, Bob Evans, Bob Fletcher, and uh, Gil Broussard. They've all got a little bit different opinions on it. So what I like, though, is I have seen a few images that definitely make me question the possibility of there being these heavenly bodies that are getting close to Earth right now that we were taught in school should not be here. Most of the stuff I see, I can discredit pretty quick as being some type of lens flare, solar flare anomaly, or just something. But there's a few out there that I definitely say, wow. There's, yeah, there's research that's, and first of all, I'm, I'm not going to support any photographs of two suns in the sky, number one, because we're not going to see this thing, not yet anyway. And the, the photographs that we see of two suns or even three suns are usually caused by a, an optical illusion. There's always clouds in the pictures. You ever notice that? There's always clouds in the pictures with two suns. Most of them. But it's not yeah. just the two. It's like it's reflect, the sun is reflecting off of another body almost. 
Yeah, kind of. And I understand. I, I've seen all of the pictures. I'm now, pretty neutral on the subject, but there are a couple that I'm like. <laughs> yeah, mm. you, you look at them and you say, that just shouldn't be there. That's just not right. And, and we do that with a lot of stuff that we see. Now, a lot of the stuff that's on the Internet now is produced. It's well produced. Right. Using computer graphics or whatever. Ten years ago, 15 years ago, actually, when I really got into the meat of, of this research to, to, to bring it up to speed, uh most of what was on the internet was done by people like me or people like you who were researching su subjects and they were putting their hard research onto the internet. And so the internet probably had about 75% truth. Now we have to search for the truth on the internet because most of it's lies. <laughs> Thank you, NSA. They don't just listen, they write. So here's, here's the situation. We have to be very discerning in everything. Now, something is there. There's no doubt about it. But is it unnatural? Because if it's a binary star, it's been cycling for at least close to 5 billion years. It has had to because the Earth is at least 5 billion years old. So it's natural. It's been there before. Has it been the thing that has created extinction-level events? Probably not. Probably not. But it brings stuff with it. Uh, we have to look at supporting evidence because photographs can lie. Photographs can be, especially, especially digital photographs. You know, when the photograph used to be on film, you could go to the film and examine it under a microscope and you could see if it was manipulated or not. You can't do that with digital images, only with film. You can look at a negative and you can see right away if it's been retouched. You know what I have noticed? Airbrushed. Oh, I, I didn't mean to interrupt, Peter. Yeah, I was just going to say. That's okay. Go ahead. You know what I have noticed is there's been people that have contacted me that I know um, that aren't even really conspiracy theorists that have called me in, from Branson, Missouri and said, hey, I saw this thing in the sky and it looked like a, you know, a second planet or a second sun or something. Can you tell me anything about planet X? And then I just gave, well, this is what I've heard. I've had multiple emails from all over the world, people that I don't know that have said, I can see something in the sky. I definitely see something there. So, you know, the people that I don't know that are sending me emails, I can't validate that, but I can certainly validate people that I know personally calling me up that have no desire to start a conspiracy theory or start some type of, you know, um, <laughs> spooks or goblins or anything like that. Yeah, so well, it is something there. Yes, something is there. Exactly what it is. We're not sure. But let's take a look at, at what our data indicates. Now, uh, was it University of California just released information a few months ago about uh, this planet? Caltech. Uh, Caltech. Yes, thank you. Uh, Caltech uh, released the information on this uh, body that they have found in space, and they've, they they haven't found it with the Hubble telescope. They're getting radio uh, waves back from it that indicate it's a large body. Why can't they see it with the Hubble telescope? You see, they, they should be able to see, if not the Hubble, what's what's the other one that's up there? I forget the, the name of the... We well, have you've two got tele Lucifer telescope here. Oh, well, that, that, that's on Earth. I'm talking about in, in orbit. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. but yeah, well, maybe they are seeing it. Yeah, and, and you see... Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but they're not telling us. You see, the people that know aren't telling us. Now, you brought up a good point, Lucifer. Lucifer is the largest infrared telescope on the planet. And it's owned by the Catholic Church. Right. Why would they name their telescope Lucifer? Well, I, I, have, I just got this information two days ago, literally, and that is that Pope Paul said, Jesus ain't coming, I'm sorry, not Pope Paul, Pope Francis has said, Jesus ain't coming back. So we're going to start worshiping Lucifer because he's going to be our savior. Did you see that video footage from the Vatican? It's a couple years old. There's, there's two videos that just blow my mind that I'm thinking about from the Vatican, but one in particular, um, the audience is singing, you know, everybody in the congregation is singing a song in Latin, and the translation of the words are on the bottom of the screen. And they're worshiping Lucifer. They're thanking Lucifer, essentially Absolutely. saying that he is the Savior. And it, it, I was like, wow, really? Yeah, really. Did Absolutely. you see that? Absolutely. You know, yes, I, I did see it. And it, 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 it horrifies me. It really does. It horrifies me. Now, I, I've got a personal stake in this. We're going to talk about this a little bit later. We'll talk a little bit more about me. But, you know, you raised some interesting questions. First, we are here. And I, I want to just dive, uh, go back to Genesis a little bit first. Um, when it says that, we are made in God's image. What's made in God's image? You see, biologically, we are vessels. Are you familiar with admiralty law? Vaguely. That okay. Has, uh, vaguely, yeah, like natural law? No, 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 no. Admiralty law is law that the United States and most of the world is under right now. Okay. In other words, we don't follow the law of the land. We follow the law of the sea. And that's why there's a gold fringe 
around all the flags in court. So when you go to court, you are viewed at as a or viewed as a vessel. The same as the ship on your birth certificate. Uh, it's all in capital letters. And then they give you an SS number. So technically, I am the SS Peter Kling. You see, I am a vessel, as we all are. Now, what are we vessels for? The image of God. You see, the biological vessel is not who we are. 